Happy December Festivals, courtesy AKPF number one. Welcome to AKPF number one tour, part one. This episode of Cop Block is brought to you by Freekeen.com. In February of 2012, I posted a write-up to CopBlock.org titled, Frustrated, Detroit Residents Compete with Police. Included in the story was a picture of Dale Brown, founder of the Threat Management Center. A year later, when I knew I was to roll through Detroit as part of the Cop Block tour, I reached out to Brown, who graciously welcomed me at his facility and shared with me some of his time and knowledge. It was definitely worth a stop. My name is Dale Brown, founder of the Threat Management Center, located in Detroit. What Threat Management Center represents in general is how to properly manage human threats to create the most nonviolent outcome possible. I started in 1995 uh, in the security capacity, helping the community deal with violent criminals. We're doing home invasions and murders in our area. I would call police, I would constantly reach out, and uh, what I found was there was a general apathy and complacency where law enforcement was just not interested as a group. There were certain officers that were motivated, and those community-oriented officers uh, bonded with our organization, and we were able to, with their assistance, uh, create a condition where all the murders, home invasions, and other types of violent crimes stopped. The result of stopping the violence and the criminal activity was a good quality of life for the residents that live there, which ultimately led to the building owners going into the black for the first time in 20 years. And it just took a couple of good officers, and my staff consisted uh, initially, uh, consisted just of me, a dog, and a rifle. And then it just grew from there. I just got volunteers from the community to help out. I got the building owners to give me one free apartment in each building and a small financial stipend. It didn't take much money, but it took lots of self-sacrifice. The key was to put the protection of the families before my own and to think about one thing which was good quality of life for the people there. And the way to do that was to use not the legal system to prosecute people, but to prevent the conditions which led to, which could lead to, violent encounters. And that includes having heroic law enforcement officers out there putting themselves at risk not thinking about themselves, not thinking about getting home to their families safely at night, but thinking about the citizens getting home to their families first and foremost. We need that kind of policing. The kind of policing we have right now typically is an officer thinking about their own safety, and that's what they're taught. 
That false thought process means they can't truly protect anyone appropriately. The cornerstone for protection is love, not violence, not guns, not laws. You cannot and you will not truly protect anything that you do not love. But if you love something, love someone, love people, you can protect them. And it starts with yourself. Having people that love themselves, love their uh, family members, love their community, love people in general, those are the people that can protect the best because they will put themselves at risk for others. And that is the key. That level of intention and dedication is the key to stopping violent predatory behavior. You want these predators to realize there is no way they're going to achieve violence perpetrated against families because, or the people that are there, because when the violent predator sees them, they're going to realize this person is dedicated to the safety there and they're going to back down. And if they don't back down, that person will be able to manage threats properly if they go through our training. And that's what really separates our organization from any other is the fact that it really is designated and designed specifically to create nonviolence. But if there is going to be violence, to make sure that you're significantly capable of managing those threats properly. We constantly recruit. We're a performance-based organization. Our bodyguard program, which is called VIPER, stands for Violence Intervention Protective Emergency Response System. The foundation for its success is in the fact that the individuals that are in our organization in order to participate have to be altruistic. Our lifeblood of this organization is having people that are really talented, really motivated, and highly skilled by constantly training them. And those people that do not want to train or are not good enough are replaced by better people. We are not looking for people and we do not accept people who are uh, human predator uh, oriented. So people that like to fight or people that like to shoot people. Uh, a lot of times guys come back from the military uh, organizations and I have to uh, be careful because we're not looking for the kind of mindset that says, you know what, it's okay to use violence uh, as long as you can legally explain it. We're looking for people that don't want to use violence under any conditions. What we emphasize is a hundred ways in a situation which would normally be fatal force oriented, a hundred ways to not have a violent or fatal incident take place. We perform 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We protect communities here in Detroit, uh, upscale communities like Palmer Woods, Sherwood Forest, and the golf course. We have approximately a thousand homes that depend on us for safety, responding to them and their uh, families and their emergencies. And we have approximately 500 home, uh, businesses that are our clients as well. And then the people that cannot afford our services, we help them for free. And the reason that we can do that is because there is a healthy profit margin left over from excellence uh, from providing for our major corporations. We offer free training to families. We call it Free Family Friday. Typically the prosecutor's offices, the shelters in the area for domestic violence victims, stalking victims are sent to us for assistance. We protect them for free. We escort them to court. If they have a violent uh, ex-husband or boyfriend or neighbor or some stranger that's that's coming after them, we will literally stay with them, transport their kids to school. We stay with them at their homes with our rifles and keep them alive. And in 20 years, none of us have uh, had a court date. And more importantly, none of us have been killed. And the most important, no one who's ever come to us for help in 20 years has ever been injured or killed after coming to uh, this organization. On Mondays, we have a free class for any sworn law enforcement officer. We have a state trooper that I've trained for 10 years who's in charge of the law enforcement section here. And we don't believe in being weapon dependent here. Here, guns are uh, like a first aid kit, something you should have, but not something you should depend on. When they have an option to not injure someone, often they would choose that had their training system given that to them. And so that's one of the things we do is try to fill a person's toolbox, thinking of their mental toolbox as, uh, the toolbox that you go around answering all your questions with, we make sure that in that toolbox are so many options to create a nonviolent outcome that it's almost impossible to have violence. So we show you how to get close, how to use psychology to, uh, to take that person's perspective and change it so there is no adversarial perspective. And if there is going to be one, you're so close, you can still take control of that person without injuring them. So it's all, it's all positive. Creating positive outcomes, nonviolence equals a prosperous outcome. And that's one of the things we want to encourage all communities, all corporations, law enforcement institutions to realize it is focusing on the prevention of the conditions which leads to violence, which is the key to creating a safe, successful society. Amagi Metals, where financial freedom is yours. Deal with Greater Cleveland Cop Block. Here in Detroit with the Cop Block Tour. Came all the way out here to visit with my buddy Pete, my new friend Garrett. Love you guys.
Learned a lot of stuff today from uh, Dale Brown of Threat Management Center. Excellent, excellent source of information. Police could learn a lot of lessons from this guy. Absolutely. And if it's not the officer that's the problem, it's not the officer that made up these rules. The officer is part of a system that told them that their safety is paramount. What's most important to the officer is they get home to their family at night. What I tell people is, and this is what we stole in our program, what's most important is that other people get home to their families at night, and then once we make sure they get home to their family at night, we can then go home to our family, knowing that we made sure they got to their family safe at night. Being a police officer, I have been able to see both sides of the fence, if you will. Police are more trained and adapted to handling things aggressively because we are the authority. We are the law. You will do what we say. Whereas threat management services more asks the person to think of a situation prior to commencing whatever they're intending on doing. And every human predator wants a way out of violence. They think they want violence, but they truly don't. They want violence, they go find violent people. They look for soft targets. They look for situations where they think they can win. It's your job to make sure they know absolutely they cannot win, and guess what? There's nothing to win. The enemy is not him. The enemy is the violence he's going to perpetrate. So once I get him to not want to do the, the, the violence, we're fine. And all I'm going to do is join him. I'm going to mirror him psychologically. So when he says, I can't believe they fired me. I can't believe that my employees pissed me off. I can't believe she did this. Whatever it is, whatever he's angry about, I'm going to come over and I'm going to be just as angry as him, if not more angry. He's going to have to try to calm me down because he and I are against whatever this is. They said he has to leave this restaurant. I'm like, I hate this restaurant anyway. I hate Italian food. I hate it. Psychologically, subconsciously, he, he knows I'm not his enemy also because of the way I'm grabbing him. I'm not collaring him. I'm, I'm manipulating his body against his will because he wants to stay here, but the elbows give me control. Physically, I can still manipulate no matter how we have to do this and maintain control without making him feel that he's being humiliated, yeah. uh, aggressed upon, or injured. He is literally being biomechanically dominated in a peaceful way. So there's no actual impact, no injury. Psychologically, we're communicating in a positive way, and this creates a non-adversarial relationship. Our rich clients generally don't have any danger. It's Hollywood. They just have lots of money. So we use the fact that they have lots of money in order to afford the fuel and the vehicles and everything else that we use to help real people that are in extreme danger. I mean, just the service that you guys provide it's like just the sense of knowing that, okay, I'm going to be able to get into the courthouse, be able to give whatever type of testimony I have to give, and I'll be able to get back to my car safe. Even just that sense of, you know, that sense of security is, is priceless. It's priceless. I mean. All right, from 6 10 p.m., uh, your name, sir? Robert Gold. Okay, and you called for assistance with a vehicle that was parked in front of your home? Right, right in front and right where our walk is. Okay, and were you satisfied with our response? Very. Okay, and we were able to get the vehicle out of here without an incident? Absolutely. Okay, sir. Thank you. Is there anything else we can do for you today? No, I really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Have a great day. All right. Just so you can see what everyone else is doing. This shows he was here. See, that's the picture. This gives the date and time he was here. This shows where he's going. This is his route. That's his name. Yeah, it's great. Transparency. That's really it is cool. transparency. And I, hey, we're not going into a, a structure to be killed or to kill someone over toasters and TVs. It's not going to happen. And that's by design. You know, there's two, just two frames of thought. I will engage with the idea that I will be uh, dominant in violence. Or you can say, I will go forward with the idea that I will not let anything create violence. And then they're opposing ideas with the same exact circumstances. Do not shoot anyone else's family member before you shoot your own family member in that same exact condition, that same situation. So if your uncle had a gun and he was standing there being threatening, would you shoot them now or would you sh talk to your uncle longer? Even in a situation where we are using live ammunition and a live firearm, we have to shoot second. That's not very fair in a gunfight, but we're not supposed to be in gunfights. That, according to our philosophy, we're against gunfighting. So if you have to shoot second, there'd be no way for you to actually shoot someone with a toy gun or a fake gun. It's impossible. And so once you explain it like that, it makes it easy. The rules of engagement are very easy. Don't use violence unless there is absolutely really no other choice. We want to make sure that 
we don't produce people that are inherently inappropriate by psychologically preparing them. So one of the things I do is I explain that it's better to die than it is to shoot the wrong person even once. He, he should be training police all over the country, honestly. This is an air canister that when the pin is pulled and thrown, a very large distraction, distracting sound uh, is um, emitted, which distracts violent people from continuing violence. Uh, pepper pistol, this pepper pistol shoots a stream and has a light, strobing and straight light. Uh, it's a steady light. And this is how we clear uh, areas and spaces uh, such as vacant homes and um, yeah, non-lethal. The Collecticon blends together uh, all your different martial arts, but it makes it simpler uh, to apply. So we're either going to escape from the person by getting away from them, or we're going to come in and take control of them. Or we come in to immobilize them and take them into custody. But standing there exchanging blows in a fighting scenario is not, is not an option for us. But the psychological belief system is just as important as the physical, uh, the physicality of the service provider. So if psychologically you're not prepared to be selfless, then you won't be. The maxims and things that the police go by these days are all based on a shoot first kind of mentality and it's, it's, it's just wrong. For example, uh, law enforcement will say things to each other commonly, they'll say, um, Hey, stay safe out there when they leave each other. Uh, at the end of roll call, when a police officer is going off to work, they'll say, hey, stay safe out there. Uh, what we say is that is in totally inappropriate because the only way to stay safe out there is to not go into danger. So what I teach and what we say to each other is make it safe out there. Make it safe out there means that's what you're supposed to do. Your task is if there's danger over there, you have an obligation to go over there and make sure that that is safe, to make safe. How do I get you to come to Cleveland? Well, that's the, that's the objective, is to go to all the cities. And, and we want to kind of use Detroit as the hub right. and say, listen, it worked there. So you heard of Detroit. Whatever problems you're having here, you know they were worse there. It works. ACPF Aqua Chicago Parking Force. Park down here. Okay. Yeah, I do. I'm, my name's Garrett. I'm visiting town from Keene, New Hampshire. Okay. And uh, I was just curious what it's like being a, a parking enforcer here in Chicago. Like, <laughs> well, uh, it's a job, man. It's a job. That's, that's you, all I can say. It's a job. Yeah. Somebody got to do it. Nobody. Everybody hate to see me coming. Mm. But when I'm here. You got to either be right or else I'm going to write you a ticket. Mm. Yeah, my friends and I in Keene will try and fill parking meters in front of people so that nobody can get a ticket. And uh, it's pretty funny. I don't know if you've heard of Robin Hooding. That's what we call it when we fill parking meters. But, oh, okay. Uh, fill, par fill parking meters for people? Yeah. Oh, uh, is that right? <laughs> yeah, and in fact, my friends and I are being sued by the city of Keene for doing that. Oh, uh, no job. Yeah, it's pretty right. funny. Well, why why y'all decide to do something like that? Well, we think it's a nice gesture to be able to save people from getting parking tickets. Well, you know, I, I, maybe it is, man, but uh, I personally feel this way. People is grown, they know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, they know the rules. They live here in the city of Chicago. They know the rules. You don't do, the, you don't do what you're supposed to do, you're supposed to pay. This city depends on that revenue. That's the reason why you're getting sued. Because this is revenue. Because we already know. People is going to do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And if they do what they do without taking care of their, what they're supposed to do, well, I have no pity for them because you know why? I'm under the same rule because I live in this city too. 
Do you get parking tickets occasionally? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And and that's what I'm saying. I, so I make it a habit. It becomes a habit. I'm making sure I protect my car at all times. Make sure I have my registration. Make sure that I have the city sticker. I make sure that I, when I park my car, I park my car and put plenty of time on there. I'd rather put an hour on there and got 30 minutes left than to put 30 minutes and short two minutes. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That's how it goes here. So, you know, that's the reason why you're getting sued, man. Yeah. Because you're messing with their revenue. True. You know what I'm saying? And, and the people that, you, that, you, that you're saving, basically it's people who really just ain't going to do the right thing. Now, I can, you know, I, I, I can understand if there's somebody who really doesn't have the money to pay and they 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 they, they, they stay close to their car they try they try not to you know they see see somebody coming they jump in and they run off because they really can't afford to pay now those the people are you know that if you can save them those are the ones that deserve to be saved but those that just pulls up park their car go and take care of their business knowing that they're taking a shot on getting the ticket Cause I do it every time. Every, every time I pull, pull my car someplace and run inside, and I always have that same thing in their mind. All I need is two minutes, just two. So I run myself in there, and I know I'm taking a shot. I know that if I get out here get a ticket, uh, well, they got me. That's all I can say. They got me. Take my ticket. I'm going down there and pay for it. Yeah. I noticed that since they have the kiosks here, it makes it so you can't really save people because it's not just a meter you can fill. But do you know of anywhere in Chicago that has meters that you can just put coins in? No. Oh, interesting. No, they they removed all those. All those meters is it's gone, long gone. Mm -hmm. uh, we moved those around two years ago. All of them. Oh. Well, it was nice talking to you. I'm Garrett, by the way. Garrett. All right, man. Keep doing what you do, man. All right. Thank you. Have all a good right. one. I'm trying to be a police. I got military background from the service. I went to, uh, the high school I went to was in Duran High School in Maryville on Broadway. Okay. Yeah, um, I had military background from the Air Force and service. I'm about. I'm right now about 40 years old. Okay. What do you? Uh, what's your feeling on just the general violence in Gary? What is, what is the solution possible uh, to the problem? Well, Gary Allen, as you know, is the capital city of murders. You know, we need, we need, we need, we need, we need the police to break the, to crack down on. on Murders in Gary, because Gary, Indiana City, Gary, where we're at right now, is the capital uh, city of murders. More murders, most of you out here, you know. They got married, but they clean out there. They ain't got too many murders. In how do you how do you feel about the current ability of the uh, the current situation regarding the police handling the violence? Well, they should the have situation. to like uh, like get some detectives to find out what the homicide or the suicide was. With 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 the violence, you know, with that, they should get detectives and uh, you know. How you do that? You detectives when they detect to see what's going on well, yeah, with the, with the crime. To get the crime scene, you know, you know, because you might, because they might make mistakes, block up a wrong person that didn't even do nothing. Right. You know, they got to investigate it. Like then, get some detectives to investigate the, the, what's going on. You know. Yeah, that creates a lifelong like how you add, criminal. Do you know, I got my ID on me. I got my ID. Right on. Cool. Well, do you okay. feel? Uh, do you feel that the um, service provided by the police force is sufficient at this point? Well, we do, we do need more help in this world, you know. Like, I got problems in my group on a couple of guys are messing me a little bit, you know, and I get mad, I, and I, I, will, I go try to tell the staff, you know, that one, because I'm in a group home, you know. I try to go tell the staff with a couple of guys messing with me, you know, they ask for cigarettes, and they already got cigarettes and stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Do they ever help you? Can they help you with that, or? Yeah, they help me with it sometimes. They help me with yeah. it. Do you know anybody who's, uh, you actually know has been a personal victim of violence in Gary, either murder or just robbery uh, or assault? Yeah. A lady named Louise Perry. And uh, it's a couple of more. And Miss Wim Cooper, she's working at Edgewater Resource Center. Miss mm -hmm. oh. uh, Miss Wim, Ms. Wim Cooper, Miss Danielle Evans. And uh, it's a couple of more. Uh, the attendants worked out. They had problems with some of the guys. You know, don't want to come to group home time. They're trying to, you know, get get people in Gary a place to stay at, like in group home. Mm -hmm. You know, they got group homes all over Gary. Miller, 
you know, all over. And you you're know. Uh, over here? Yeah, I'm at Fofo Fo Film on Street behind Turning Point in Transition. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, do you, uh, do you see a lot of crime around here? Or is it is it mostly just stuff you hear yeah. about in the paper? Well, well one of the guys that lived in the group home, his name was Jason. Mm -hmm. He still, he tried to steal from the stores over there, clothes, like shoes. He tried to steal them and bring them in the house, you know. They got him, the detective guy, you know, got him. You know, he ain't at the group home now. He left about four, six months ago, you know. He went somewhere to try to steal some in another city or something, you know. Yeah, they're yeah. looking for him. They got they got him most wanted. They're looking for him. You know, take a man. His name is Jason Smith. Jason Smith. I think he's the Thomas family. Uh, fifth oldest his brother, Jason. Yeah. The individuals that you know who are victims of violence, do you know or do you feel that the police were able to successfully resolve the issues, or did they uh, were they able to? Are they still help looking them out? for? Right, were they Somebody able to help them out? Was anything brought to resolution? But they ain't got you. The, it was a real couple. Like they're looking for Lee Harvey Oswald, the tech looking for him, Lee Harvey Oswald, and Diligent, and you know, they're looking for, uh, what's his name? Uh, his name Anthony and I took a fat guy hanging around Dora Miller out there by uh, Jewish School of Marshall Town, True Fellow Gary Allen, and Dora Miller, a guy named Anthony Antoine Pope. His name is uh, Sean Connery. He's uh, Rod, you know Roger Moore mm -hmm. on the uh, James Bond spy movies. His Roger Moore enemy, Sean Connery. Yeah, he's Sean Connery. They're looking for him. He's Lee Harvey Oswald. He kidnapped the lady named, uh, I think she was white. Her name is Nancy Joe. The police looking for her. They've been looking for her. They said, they said no man has seen Nancy Joe. Really? Mm -hmm. They said no man ever seen her. You in know, the, she on this whole world, Nancy Joe. In the, uh, in the jail here and in the prison, there's a lot of people locked up for drug offenses. Do you think it would be a better idea if the police were focusing more on crimes where there's a victim as opposed to, you know, certain other offenses? Yes, right. I was locked up in here too. I was locked up in 13. I didn't do nothing. I told I'm a policeman. I'm a uh, ROTC. I'm a I'm a reserve officer training course. I'm a ROTC. I was, uh, you know, I ain't had to go to the school to serve to be a police. I was already born a, a resident policeman. You know, I'm about. I think I'm the chief of police. I'm over. Uh, I'm over. Uh, I'm the chief of police. My name is Officer Adam. Mm -hmm. You know, like Adam Eve in the Paradise Kingdom. I am Adam. My twin sister is Eve. I'm Officer Adam. I'm the chief of police up here. They you know, I spoke down there, and one of my one of my one of my uh, deputies come out and tell me to go way down there and spoke. I said, I started taking badge for that. I'm the general. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I tried to wear. You know, I got a badge. Uh, well, they're supposed to work for the public, right? They're supposed to yeah, work. Yeah, I'm the chief of police over every man. I'm the chief over this police station in Madville, Chicago, California. Yeah, I'm the chief. I'm the highest male chief, not the highest woman chief police, but the highest male chief police. Wow. Cool. My name is Officer Adam. Right on, man. Well, here's uh here's a card with our uh, our group. Check yeah. it out on Facebook if you got access to computer. Yeah, okay. but uh, we do a lot of a lot of stuff online. Yeah, I put this in my wallet. Thank you. You're welcome, thank man. You. Good talking to you. Okay, camera man. Yeah, thank you, yeah, man. Detective and camera man. Take care. All right, take it easy. All right. You guys want to uh, do a little bit more before we get, get dark? <laughs>